All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dennis Elias. I'm here with Alp Adebeck. We are here from AFS Financial Group and AFS 401k. If any of you uh, clicked on our link on LinkedIn and signed up as well, we welcome you and are excited to give this presentation today on decluttering your financial life. So a lot of clients and people we know have been telling us that they're doing a lot of home repairs and just overall tidying up around the home. And so we thought it would be a great time to discuss how to declutter some of that paperwork or files that you have on your uh, local computers and better organize them and what you should keep, what you shouldn't keep. Uh, so we're gonna touch on a lot of things today. If at any point you have a question, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So you can go ahead and click on that. The question will come to us and uh, we will answer that. And we did receive a couple of questions prior to the webinar. We'll address these after we've gone through the slides along with any questions, uh, additional questions at the end. So before we get started, I know that Alp wanted to tell us one of his recent decluttering stories. So I'll <laughs> let him take it from here. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, so for me, you know, like everybody else uh, in this COVID era, you know, we've been trying to clean up a little bit, uh, but it started a little bit earlier for me. A few years ago, I decided I wanted to stop acquiring stuff and start getting rid of stuff. And my first area of focus was my closet. I decided to get rid of clothes that I wasn't wearing anymore. In addition, I established a new rule. If I bought new clothes, I had to get rid of old clothes. If I buy two new dress shirts, I get rid of two old dress shirts. A simple rule that I love. Cleaning my closet happened in stages. The first round was easy. Get rid of clothes that I didn't like or that were a little weathered, but that still left me with more clothes than I needed. And so every few months I'd walk into my closet and say, I can get rid of more stuff. And I'd take another five or 10 items to the local charity. And it made me feel good getting rid of the excess clutter. I had this really nice leather coat that I hadn't worn in 10 years. So I should have gotten rid of it, but it was so nice. I kept making excuses to keep it, thinking I'll wear it again someday. A few months ago, I walked in my closet. It looked great, but I knew I could get rid of a few more items. And I looked over the leather coat and said, finally, it's time to go. But I decided to try it on just to confirm it was the right decision. Anyway, I hadn't worn the coat in 10 years. And when I put it on, it was two sizes too big for me. It was from my old weightlifting days and it looked like a tent around my shoulders. And, and I just started laughing, thinking of all the excuses I had made over the last few years to keep the coat and it didn't even fit. I took it straight to the charity and felt great that someone else will enjoy my coat. And now when I walk into my closet, I feel good that I wear everything in there. And that's the same feeling you'll get when you clean up all of your financial clutter and only keep the things you really need to keep. Thanks, Al. That's, that's a great story. I know I have uh, several items of clothing that I haven't worn in years, and I think that someday I'll wear them. <laughs> <laughs> but one of these days, I'll, I'll get rid of them. <laughs> so uh, just wanted to get started here talking again about your financial records, differentiating between your personal and business records. So uh, business records really are going to be a lot more important. Uh, this would be any b records with relation to self-employment, uh, business you own with partners, or even a rental home that you have. That would also be considered a business record. Uh, why is this so important? It really becomes cumbersome if there is a business issue uh, with regards to your taxes or just any sort of filing especially with taxes, the burden of proof is on you to back up every item on your tax return with some sort of documentation. So the best approach, especially for small businesses, is to try to keep as many records as you can, preferably in a digital format. And in a digital format, it really is just a lot easier, we've found, to uh, find whatever you need. You can sort it by year, by category, um, all sorts of things. I know that uh, I've heard stories from Alp when back in the day, in the office, uh, there were filing cabinets across the walls. And we've pretty much gone all digital now, and it's just a lot easier. I can't imagine having to sift through all those files. Uh, I luckily did not have to do that. So transitioning to digital really is a great idea. 
Um, now, of course, it really comes down to preference and what uh, Alp and I have found is that it really comes down to a generational difference. For younger folks, if you ask them for their tax return, they're gonna get on their iPhone, on the cloud, pull it up within a matter of seconds. Uh, when, whereas the older generations, for example, my mom, she likes to keep all her tax returns in paper um, in no particular order, but she just likes to have that physical copy. So it really is uh, funny sometimes to see the big difference. And there is, of course, a big digital push nowadays. And pers personally, uh, I'm all for it. And I know that we here at AFS do recommend to consider starting to go digital. Uh, once you go digital, there's really no need to destroy anything. Whereas paperwork, you're always wondering, how long should I keep these tax, re tax returns? Uh, someone told me it was three years. For a more complex tax return, seven years. Well, what's a more complex tax return? You know, there are a lot of different factors that come to effect. When you go digital, you don't have to worry about any of that. So just a couple of questions to ask yourself when it comes to storing documents is, how would I recover these files in a fire, flood, or any disaster that would destroy the paperwork? Now, if there were a fire, of course, we don't wish this upon anyone, but if there were a fire at your home and you have all your paperwork there, it's really gonna be lost forever. So having a digital backup on your laptop in the cloud and also having a separate uh, hard drive that you can store elsewhere is really important and really a lot more beneficial than having the paper copies because you can pull it up in a matter of seconds. Uh, do you have enough room to store all these files? So if you wanna store seven years worth of tax records, that may take um, a lot of file folders and possibly a couple of filing cabinets. In, uh, are, do you have the time, storage space, and would you like to put in the effort to file all these things? Um, some of you may already do this, filing everything uh, religiously, but when everything is on a computer, it's just a couple of clicks in a couple of seconds, you'll pull what you need up. And then uh, just kind of in that same vein, can you find specific files quickly? So going to the filing cabinet and sifting through all those papers is generally gonna take a lot longer than going onto a file folder on your computer. And they even have search bars now where you can type in 2019 tax return, it'll pull that up right away. So. Uh, while we're all for digital, if you do still like paper, um, of course, you can do that uh, when it comes to filing, where you should file these, we'll review this in a little bit. Um, but either way, we would like to review some of the more important records to keep. Uh, starting off with home records. So uh, settlement sheets uh, from sales of home, IRS form 2119. Alp, I know you're a lot more familiar with this in particular. Um, if you want to give us some insight there. Sure. So on the settlement sheets, you know, when you're buying and selling a house, that's actually a reportable transaction on a tax return. And it gets summarized on IRS form 2119. So you actually need to keep the settlement sheets to kind of prove what your basis is. And of course, you need the settlement sheet when you sell the house. And if you sold a house uh, and bought a house, let's say 25 years ago, there was actually a different rule around and your accountant might need the last 2119 form that you filed. So that's something that if you're going through old tax returns and you're getting rid of some of that stuff, and we'll go over that in a little bit, you wanna to try to find in the year that you sold the house, if there's an IRS form 2119. And it's basically, again, it's the summary of the sales exchange of the principal residence. Go ahead, Dennis. Thanks, Al. Uh, so a couple other items, home title and deed, very important to keep. You can keep a physical copy of this, um, that's totally fine. Uh, one of the more important items that we want to review here is record of any home improvements. So uh, not this is not repairs to your home, but things that add value, uh, adding a deck, uh, redoing your basement, uh, something that is more beneficial in the future when you sell it. So for example, uh, how does this come into play? It comes into play by reestablishing your basis. If I were to buy a home for $300,000, I made $100,000 of home repairs. If I save those records, I can, at the time of sale, add that $100,000 to my basis. So my new basis becomes $400,000. So if, for example, let's say there was a lot of appreciation, the home is now worth a million dollars. I first, if I had a $400,000 basis, it would just be $600,000 of gain. If I had a $300,000 basis, that would add another $100,000 of gain. And 
Uh, for a married couple, you do have up to $500,000 of exclusion on a gain. So in that example, uh, $200,000 would be taxable if you did not have those home improvements on file. If you could add that to your basis, you would reduce that taxable amount to $100,000. So very important. Uh, it'll save you a lot of money and it'll, uh, you'll have the proof if it, it, anyone... Yeah, and Dennis, I'll add to that that uh, in all my years of doing tax work, I'll call it in the old days, uh, there's a lot of people that didn't have records for everything. And I would actually say the best way to kind of do that when you actually do sell your house is I tell people to walk through their house whether they've already gotten rid of it, but kind of visualize it room by room. And then also on the outside and think of all the improvements you did to the home over the years. And so, you know, the IRS doesn't really audit much here, but if you do happen to have a large gain on the property and it becomes a taxable gain, obviously it's to your advantage to have as much records as possible and as high of a basis as possible to reduce that tax gain. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah. And two other important items, homeowners insurance policies. Uh, when it comes to these homeowner insurance policies, we also recommend having an inventory of any valuable assets in your home. A lot of insurance agencies, I know State Farm, if you email them, they'll actually send you an inventory list that you can fill out yourself and have everything on file in case anything were to happen. You have uh, what was in the home, the value, and uh, a description. So pretty important item there that a lot of people may uh, not remember to do, but Again, important. And then mortgage payoff documentation. So if you've been fortunate enough to pay off your mortgage, certainly keep any files from the lender that show the proof that you paid it off. Um, now, we did get a question here from someone. So when you, have, when you have your documents in digital format, how do you make sure you can read them seven plus years from now uh, mm -hmm. with regards to software compatibility? Uh, good question. I would say uh, for the most part, Everyone today uses Microsoft Word um, or PDF. Those are likely gonna stay the same in the next seven plus years. There may be some changes into the format and compatibility, but generally you can always, uh, I know that for example, Microsoft Word is if it was saved in an older version, you can actually convert it to the newer version of Word. So as long as you keep that on your laptop or in a, a separate drive, and at a later point you come to, to get it, it should automatically ask you, would you like this to, would you like to convert this to a newer format? Um, so I think that that's a great question and uh, certainly concern, but for the most part, we believe that things will likely stay within Microsoft Word, PDF, and if there is a new version, they're likely gonna have some conversions there as well. Like Apple has their programs uh, that you can convert to Word or Excel or whatever program you use. And I'll say that's probably, that question is probably another great example, Dennis, of the difference between my generation and your generation, where I think, you know, my generation, we're always worried about, I'm so used to the, the paper copies that I can see it and maybe not fully trusting the digital format that I'll be able to pull it up later if my computer crashes, et cetera. Whereas I think in your generation, uh, you know, a lot of people tell us that they don't even have printers anymore, mm -hmm. right? They just store everything in some type of PDF format and they're comfortable with it. It's all in the cloud too. But go ahead. Exactly. Yeah. And then we also got another question. Will these slides be available after the webinar? Uh, they will. We will be sending that uh, a recording for you to watch or share with anyone that you would like. So let's talk a little bit about tax records. Possibly the most important thing to hold on to. Uh, some places say to hold on to these records for three years. Others say seven for more complex returns. In general, we're going to say save them uh, for up to 10 years. So this, is, this applies to income tax returns and any tax records used to prepare the tax returns. So W-2s, 1099s, uh, K-1s, any support for the different schedules. So Schedule A, C, D um, for itemized deductions. Uh, self-employment income, et cetera. If you do keep these in paper, we recommend that you put them in a large envelope. I know Alp has had experience uh, from his accounting days on this, but putting it in one large envelope uh, with every, for every year. So 20 time, for example, 2019 tax records, you're gonna put your 1040, your W-2s, uh, your schedules and any support for them in that and then save them somewhere where you can find them quickly. Uh, if you've done a 
uh, digital tax returns, so through TurboTax, for example, they will actually keep that for you. I use TurboTax and they have my past 10 years of tax returns on there. I also download them to my uh, personal laptop where I also have records for them. So super easy. Uh, and if you work with an accountant, pretty much all accountants nowadays are gonna use uh, an electronic format that they can send to you immediately as soon as you ask. So um, if you don't have those already, you can email your accountant and they should be able to send you digital copies. And, and Dennis, I'll add that uh, one of the reasons we recommend holding on to the returns for longer than is really legally required is back in the tax day, I would say once in a blue moon, it was very rare when it happened, but a client would get a letter from the IRS asking for, you know, the 2007 tax return. You know, I stopped doing tax returns a long time ago, but, and so they would actually have to pull into their files and then prove that they filed it for that particular year. So, you know, you do see things like that happen, very rare, but you're better off holding on to things a little bit longer. Yep. So we talked a little bit about business records. Again, the burden of proof is really upon you if you were to ever get audited or if anyone wants any further information. And it can be cumbersome, especially, for example, if something were wrong on the return and uh, you were to receive an a, uh, amendment. You had to do an amendment to your return. Uh, not only do you have to do a return, but if you have any partners, they also have to do an amended return. So it really becomes a bit of a compounding effect. Uh, so some of the important documents we have here, articles of the corporation, organization, uh, generally any documents that show the establishment of your business. Uh, permits and licenses, tax returns, uh, especially employment tax returns, purchase and sale of any assets for the business, insurance policies, loan records, accounts receivable. Uh, really the more the better. And again, digital format is probably going to be the easiest way uh, because as you could imagine, if you keep all these things on file, it's going to be a lot. Um, and as a business owner, especially if you have a large business, the you have a fiduciary fiduciary duty to keep all these records on files and to file uh, everything correctly. So uh, really becomes very important as you grow your business. Yeah, on that subject, Dennis, I'll add that, uh, you know, when I got out of the tax business, actually it was in the year 2000, um, it was a separate corporate entity from what we use now for the financial group. And, uh, you know, I got rid of everything generally about 10 years afterwards, I actually finally got rid of all those records and just, you know, shredded everything that I could shred, so. Yeah. And we do have a question here, going back to the home records. Um, so what is the exclusion on gain of a home for single taxpayers? So for single taxpayers, it's 250,000. If you're married, it doubles up to the $500,000. Going back to personal records, so a couple other miscellaneous records to save, legal and estate documents. We'll touch a little bit more on estate documents. These are really important um, later here in these slides. Insurance policies, stocks and bond certificates. This is only gonna apply if you hold them in actual certificate format, so a physical certificate. Uh, we don't, it's rare to see this nowadays. Uh, some people still do have them and if you do have them, you wanna hold on to them because if you replace them, there is a fee, it is a little bit of a pain. Um, and we would recommend if you uh, have the opportunity to put these, to consolidate these into a brokerage account. So you can actually take it if you have an investment account somewhere and they can deposit it in there and get rid of the certificates so that you don't have to worry about holding on to them. Uh, pension documentations, and then marriage and divorce uh, certifications. These are important when it comes time to file for Social Security. If you're filing for a spousal benefit or an ex-spousal benefit, you're going to want to have this because the Social Security Administration oftentimes asks for this uh, proof. And then again, just a couple other items, birth certificates, adoption papers, uh, passports, all, all very important items to still keep um, and keep these, of course, for the long term. Now, probably the, the best part that will give a lot of people relief, I know that I'm victim to saving a lot of these things in the past, and uh, I realized I, I moved recently from my old apartment to a new one, and I, 
had all these files and I thought at some point I would use them and I never actually did. So when it comes to utility bills, uh, internet bills, phone bills, if they're personal, just go ahead and uh, get rid of them. There really is no big incentive to hold on to them. Um, and if you've canceled the, any of these, you really don't have to go back and see them now. Of course, if you own a business, you do want to hold on to them. But for the most part, you can just get rid of them. Um, sign up for the online account if you can. And if you're comfortable, you can also set up auto pay. So you don't even have to uh, worry about it. They'll text you the bill and you can review it. And, and Dennis, I'll add to this. On, on some of the simple things like utility bills, you know, I look at my lifetime and I've never ever contested one. The only time that I ever really looked heavily into the utility bill is there was a water leak in my front yard once and my water bill for one month skyrocketed. And so I you know, was looking at the bill and I noticed it compared it to, to some of the other months and you know, confirmed that I had a water leak. But, but other than that, I mean, you generally can just get rid of all those type of bills. This, to me, as soon as I pay them, I just throw them away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it is nice now. I know that some companies will text you too, so you can see if there's a larger bill. It's like, why did this come out so high? And then you can go in and look at it like, like you did, Al. Uh, so paycheck stubs. Um, so I know a lot, I know some people that like to hold on to paycheck stubs. Uh, really, if you want to hold on to them, we would say don't hold on to them past a year. Uh, some people like to possibly cross reference their W 2 with their paychecks. Uh, once you've done that, there's not going to be a big need for them, so you can go ahead and trash them. I know that a lot of employers uh, now have online sites where you can go and get your W-2s and uh, paychecks as well, so that further depletes the need to have these in paper format. You can pull them up at, at whatever point in time. Uh, very important here, uh, expired items, credit cards, visas, passports, and IDs. Definitely trash these and shred them. As soon as they become expired, uh, there's no need to hold on to them and possibly have your information compromised. Um, I know that for credit cards, you can slice them up with the scissors, same with the uh, visa, passport, and ID. And then, of course, any paper statements when you already have digital copies. Uh, no, no real need to keep paper backup. Just if you can, keep a digital backup, as I've uh, mentioned a couple times here. Also want to touch on receipts. Uh, I know my mom really likes to keep her receipts uh, for everything. So uh, generally there's not gonna be a big need to keep receipts. If it's for your business, you may wanna hold on to it. If you have warranty on the item, you may wanna hold on to it. Um, but other than that, go ahead and trash them. Many places nowadays too have the uh, electronic payments. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, uh, where it's like a little pad that they just slide around and they can actually send the receipt direct to your email. So you don't even need to have it on paper. And I think also if you're buying stuff online, you know, places like Amazon have all of your past purchases for yep. you. So they're already stored for you. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so when it comes to safe disposal of all these paper items and also electronics, uh, with paper items, definitely uh, uh, trying to buy a shredder if you don't already have one is a great idea. I know Alp mentioned earlier a cross-cut shredder. This, uh, kind of double shreds it, make sure that nobody can see any information on there. If you don't have a shredder and maybe you, you don't want to go out and get a shredder, a lot of communities now have uh, community shredding days. So this is where they have essentially a free service. They have an industrial size shredder come. You take your paperwork, they shred it for you, and you don't have to worry about it. A lot of local printing shops also have this. UPS offers this service. So there are a lot of different resources where you can take your paperwork. Uh, and then also your office may have a shredder. And uh, I know that we have a uh, shredder in our office that I sometimes use out maybe like one or two pieces of paper, <laughs> uh, nothing big there. Uh, so that is also an idea. And then a, a nice idea I, I saw was composting. If you have a sort of, some sort of compost, any shredded paperwork, you can put it in the compost and you can grow your garden with it. So I thought that was a great use of that uh, trash. When it comes to electronics, iPhones, laptops, desktops, you're going to want to look for what's called a factory reset. So what that does, it, it essentially wipes your entire phone and laptop. And uh, you'll once it's done, it'll be just like when you bought it. So there will be no files on it, no information on it. 
if you have any trouble doing this, you can always go to your local uh, Geek Squad at Best Buy or your Apple store and they can uh, tell you how to do this. Uh, when it comes to portable drives where you keep information, uh, really you want to wipe them before getting rid of them and then afterwards you can destroy them um, however you'd like. You know, I personally at times when we gotten rid of some uh, old computers in the office, we'll take out the hard drives and actually drill through them mm -hmm. to try to get uh, so they're inaccessible. Yep, yep. There are even some YouTube videos out there if anyone <laughs> wants to look at those on how to uh, effectively get rid of that. So we talked, we've talked a lot about digital, so I want to touch a little more on how to go digital. Again, why do we go digital? It really comes down to the ease of access. You can search files easily by name, by date, uh, super streamlined. When it comes time, if you've made the decision to go digital, if you haven't already, uh, so the biggest tack, task is gonna be collecting all that paperwork. For some of you, it may be a couple pages. For some of you, it may be hundreds of pages. Uh, but collecting it and sorting it by year, category, for example, uh, taxes, statements, etc. Once you have that, uh, possibly investing in a scanner if you don't already have one there. You can also go to your local printing shop and they can scan this for a small fee as well. If you do take it to a printing shop, make sure you take uh, external drive, like a external hard drive, USB with a lot of space in it so that they can store it in there. Once they're done with that, you can go home, plug it into your laptop, uh, save everything, organize it, uh, and encrypt it. So making sure that it's encrypted. When you create a folder, there is an option to encrypt this and secure it on top of the security that your laptop already has. So we do recommend doing that uh, and always putting it on a backup or what's called a mirror drive. So why do this? Very important. If something were to happen to your computer, you don't want to lose all those files. Uh, just like you don't want to lose your paper files if something were to happen at your house. So having that backup drive stored in a fireproof lockbox or even at your in your uh, bank box is a great idea so that if you ever lose those files, you can pull them up right away. Um, so talked a little bit about storage. Uh, so fireproof lockbox, great place to put uh, not only valuables, but important documents uh, like your passport, keep them close to you at home. In the safe deposit box, you can keep things also valuables, I would say insured valuables, so that if anything were to happen at the bank, you would have insurance against it. Um, backup drives, birth, marriage, divorce certificates, uh, things of that nature. If you do still wanna keep some uh, paper files, putting them in a file folder in a filing cabinet uh, with dividers, dividing it by year, category, et cetera, really do whatever helps you best uh, find those files whenever that the time comes. And, and then, on that subject of the, the file folders, uh, I know when we moved offices about seven or eight years ago, and we were at that point making a complete commitment to going digital, so we had a lot of extra file cabinets. Turned out they were pretty much worthless. You couldn't sell them anywhere. Nobody really wanted them. <laughs> no, it was kind of funny. And, and, and recently we were looking at, uh, like we do in our office space and they were showing us the changes that have happened in the last like 10 years in office space design. And we looked at some old bank pictures and from 10 years ago, there was hallways with file cabinets from side to side and all that is now gone today. So it really is interesting how the digital world has changed all of that, even things like office design and, and truly like, you know, if you're saving a lot of stuff at home, most people don't have file cabinets anymore. Just like, you know, very small areas. They just keep a handful of papers if they're digital. Yeah. Yeah. And we just had a, a great question come in that leads into the next topic I was going to talk about. So is there a reputable online backup service that you recommend for additional disaster recovery support? So wanted to touch a little bit on cloud storage. Uh, Google is probably the most well-known. They have Google Drive that you, you use through your Gmail account. So this is a place where you can log in, you log into your Google Drive, and you essentially drag and drop any folders that you have on your computer onto Google Drive. You can orga organize it just like you do on your computer, and that's backed up 
essentially in the cloud. So you can pull it up on your phone, you can pull it up on your laptop, desktop, uh, wherever you are in the world. Now, of course, it, is, it does run through Gmail, so you have to have uh, your security on there. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about two-factor authorization and how to better protect your files once they're on the cloud. Uh, but that is probably the most reputable source out there. I know there are many others. Um, Alp, I'm not sure if you have no, I think that's a good there, answer. but yeah. Yep. Good answer. Yep. Yeah. And so as we, as we start to go digital, it does actually become a little uh, cumbersome at times. I know I fall victim to this. Once you start to open that uh, online bank account, credit card account, online utility account, uh, mortgage account, there's a lot of different websites that you have to log into and remember passwords to. So this is probably my biggest pain uh, when it comes to collecting data. Uh, recently, I've discovered password managers. These are offered through places like uh, Apple. Apple has a password manager. LastPass is probably one of the more reputable uh, private password managers and uh, Google. So if any of you use Google Chrome and have ever logged into a website, you'll see a little Dropbox drop down that says, would you like to save this login information? You can click never or save. That's their version of a password manager. So if in the future, if you save that, you go to that same site, it'll pre-fill your username and password. You'll log in in a breeze. Now, of course, you do have to log into your Gmail account to get there. Um, personally, I use LastPass. I do like this better. The way LastPass works is you have your username and password. So you have a master password. Uh, you do want to make this as secure as possible. Uh, so you type in your master password and once you're in, you can start adding the different sites. So for example, if you have a Fidelity account, if you have a TD bank account, if you have a Gmail login, you can add all those URLs, put in your username. It'll even generate a new password for you if you'd like with however many characters, uh, numbers, special characters that you'd like to put on there. So it really makes things a lot more efficient, a lot faster. Once you've established everything, you log into LastPass, click on fidelity.com. It takes you straight to the link and pre-fills your username, password, and you're logged in. So super easy, of course, making that, again, as secure as possible to log into LastPass so that you're not compromised. Uh, personally, I can sometimes be a little bit of a skeptical person. So what I've done, I use LastPass for things like utility accounts, um, investment account logins where I, it doesn't involve any money movements. Um, so I use them for things of that nature. Now for my bank account and credit card, those are the two accounts that I actually have separate uh, logins for. So I don't keep them on LastPass just in case they're both, they're separate. I've protected myself a little bit more. So I think that's a good strategy to do if you're uh, wondering about security when it comes to these things. Um, so how safe is the Google save, save box question we got in? Uh, so Google is, I mean, one of the largest tech companies out there, I'll say they have a uh, huge server, server of capacity and a lot of encryption with their services. So that's probably going to be the best bet when it comes to security. Uh, so I, I certainly like that and I've used it. I know that a lot of uh, companies that I've worked for have actually used Google Drive as well. And in college, we also use this. Um, so that's a great resource. Uh, how long should I keep paper backup for tax returns. Um, so if you want to keep it on paper, we would say uh, seven years is going to be the ideal time to keep those. Again, you'll, you'll generally not need it to be kept that long, but it's just so much easier just to keep it, establish a rule. And so, you know, once you've gotten to that period where you've got seven years of backup, kind of like my story of when I buy new clothes, I get rid of some old clothes, you could actually take you know, the new return and take an old return out and shred it if you're keeping a paper copy. However, you want to confirm that you don't have a form 2119, what I mentioned earlier, for the sale of a principal residence in that particular tax return. You want to save that. Yep, and again, um, asking your accountant for a digital copy, if you don't already have that, um, they should all have that and they have it in their file folder, so you can have it in your file folder as well pretty easily. Uh, so, Keeping your online account safe. We talked about LastPass, we talked about Google Drive. Uh, just a couple of words of advice to keep these 
accounts uh, safer than they already are. So creating a strong password, something with eight characters or more, I would say, some special symbols, adding numbers, adding letters. I think also a good uh, piece of advice is not using any words in the dictionary. This is something that a lot of uh, hackers can actually work, work through. So using words in the dictionary to hack into the account. So coming up with a creative password and also adding two-factor authorization. Um, so what this does, if you're not already familiar, uh, when you log into Gmail, Yahoo Mail, et cetera, they're gonna, send you, they're gonna send you another screen after you type in your username and password. It'll pop up, it'll say, we have sent another code to your phone. It'll be a six digit code in general that they'll text your phone. So you look at that, you type it in, and once you've done that, then it'll proceed to your account. So this is a great security method. You're the only one with access to your phone. You're the only one with access to your texts. So if anyone's trying to log in remotely, they have your username and password, they still won't be able to log in because they don't have access to your phone. So always setting up two-factor authorization uh, when that's available. So we'd like to switch gears a little bit. I mentioned uh, legal and estate documents in particular. We wanna talk about estate documents. So preparing your next of kin. And really this can be at any age. I would say even for me, I'm 27. It's good to have someone that knows where your things are. So you wanna prepare your, whether it's your kids, your spouse, um, a charity that you want to donate your assets to uh, when you're uh, no longer here, uh, preparing them and letting them know uh, where your assets are. A lot of people call this a what if checklist. So coming up with a document that's easy to understand that lists things such as your accountant, their uh, contact information, your estate attorney's contact information, the different logins you have, um, any, any online accounts where you're withdrawing or depositing money in. This is actually an issue we've found in the past where somebody passes away and uh, they didn't turn off the bill that they paid every month. So they actually kept running the bill as the, as the person was no longer here. So very important, making sure that everything is settled um, if at some point it needs to be done. Uh, and, and basically someone knows where they have to go to if, if something happens to you. Uh, again, whether it's a spouse, whether it's your executor, you know, there needs to be some type of system in place to make this a easy transition. Yep. And so in the same vein, estate documents, who should have copies of your estate documents? Generally anyone that you have named uh, to have a power within those documents. So for example, in your will, you're gonna to wanna to have your executor have that, have a copy of that uh, for any trusts that you may have, the trustees, for any power of attorneys, uh, the power of attorney should have that. And then uh, a little bit, uh, touching a little bit on medical power of attorneys and uh, medical directives. So these are a little bit different. You're gonna to wanna to have your primary care physician and uh, your local hospital have a copy of this. Now, why is that? If anything were to happen to you, there's a medical emergency, a decision needs to be made. The primary care physician should know who to contact immediately. They shouldn't have to wonder if this exists or where to find it. It'll make things a lot more streamlined and it'll uh, make things flow according to your wishes. So very, very important to have these not only in your files, but in your uh, physician's files. And then, uh, Generally, for most people, the executor and trustee and uh, POAs will always be the same person for the most part. So that makes those things pretty easy as well. And then having backup of all of those copies, uh, many attorneys already have digital copies of this. So you can ask them again, just like you would ask your accountant to, to have copies of these. And, and I'll add that when it comes to the medical power of attorney, a lot of times the local hospital will have a separate form that they want you to fill out. They will not go with your estate attorney prepared document. They want it actually on their specific format just to make sure there's no clarity issues. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we also received a question on this topic. So I wanted to touch on it here a little bit. Um, TOD and POD accounts uh, designations. So this is gonna apply not to your retirement accounts because you already have beneficiaries on those things like your 401k uh, and, <clears throat> and IRA. But for your taxable accounts, your bank accounts, investment accounts, you can add what's called the TOD or POD designation. So transfer on death, payable on death. 
bank accounts are going to be payable on death. Investment accounts are going to be transfer, transfer on death. Uh, what this does, it works just like your retirement accounts. You name a beneficiary. Uh, when you pass, it'll pass to that beneficiary. It won't have to go through the courts. They, nobody will have to decide who it goes to. Very streamlined process to pass your assets on. Um, you can also add a TOD deed to your home, actually, where it'll pass your home without having to go through the courts, uh, also known as probate. And, so, and I'll say on, on this particular subject, this is best to be worked with on, uh, I'll say an overall state plan with your state attorney. So make sure they're aware of any designations that you would like to put on specific accounts to ensure that it conforms with your overall state plan. Yep, yep. If you have a trust and a will, it may conflict. So just double check with your state attorney whether that makes sense. Yeah, so. So we'd like to, looks like we're running here close to the next hour. We just wanted to touch base on some of the questions that we, that we received through most of your emails. We had a decent number of questions, so just wanted to go through this list here. Um, I think that we did address the TOD and POD question there. Um, so one thing on that for the TOD and POD, um, it would be in case of death. So it would not be in the case of disability. If you would like someone to manage your accounts in case of your disability, it would be good to have a uh, power of attorney. And then so another, another question we got was uh, kind of some of these are financial related. Should we move our 401k investments to a safer investment vehicle? He says not entirely on topic, but hopefully you can find a minute or so to quickly address this and Kind of discuss a little further and obviously there's a lot going on right now we've still clearly you know in the midst of the pandemic and we have uh, a fairly important election coming up so a uh, lot of nervousness overall one of the things that we recommend for everybody is to review your risk profile confirm it matches with how your asset allocation is right now so if you need to do a little uh, rebalancing great time to do rebalancing and if you're really nervous we're big fans of trimming but not taking everything off the table. Uh, you know, so many times somebody wants to sell completely out and try to outguess the markets. And you know, our view is you're better off trimming. If the market goes down, you feel good that you trimmed a little bit. If the market continues to rally, you feel good that you didn't sell everything. So that's our thought on that. Dennis, interesting question on uh, when combining households, what is important to keep or throw away? I don't know if you want to address that. You want me to address it? Sure. So um, I would say, so we will actually send a recording after, after this webinar along with the checklist. I think that that'll help a lot in um, helping you understand what personal documents you should keep. Uh, even if you are combining households, it would still be good to hold on to some of the records. Uh, also holding on to, I'm not sure if there's a marriage involved but holding on to all of those records as well um alp sure so i'll, I'll say uh, other things like if you're combining households you want to make sure that you've updated your estate plan and your beneficiaries to re to reflect that they you know to make sure they reflect the combined household and what your wishes are so it's really important so if it's a you know a second marriage and there's kids from the previous marriage there's a lot of planning work that is required here and uh, it really does take a decent amount of time. So I'd, I'd probably say that's probably the best advice we could give you on that. Uh, um, uh, whatever this is, not knowing who will be in office next term. What would you do if you have less than 10 years to retirement? Uh, kind of that question I've already answered. I'd say just confirm your risk profile. Uh, I think it's easy right now if you've got new money that you're kind of earmarked for the market, this is separate from like ongoing 401k investments through payroll. But if you have some new cash that came in and you're thinking about adding it to the market, but you're nervous, I think it's an easy time to, to step aside a little bit and just wait till you see what happens. And also wait till we get a little bit more detail on what's going to happen with the pandemic. Uh, so again, the question, you know, the follow-up question on was if you had extra cash, uh, so also had another question says, if you have a house worth 500,000 that's paid off, would you take money against your house to reinvest knowing interest rates are very low? And so my personal response to that is no. 
And in all my years of doing tax work, I have, and doing the financial work, I've never met anybody that wasn't happy that their house was paid off. And knowing that regardless of what happened to their investments, they had the house paid off. So personally, I wouldn't take the money out. I would just be comfortable that you've accomplished that major goal. Uh, it's just not worth the risk in our opinion, not worth jeopardizing uh, you know, the, the equity you have built up in your house. And then we had another question here. Uh, can you please touch on getting started late in straightening out a financial life? So it's never too late to start straightening out your financial life. There are always changes that can be made. Generally, the biggest change that you can make is reducing your expenses. But along with that, uh, increasing your savings, uh, considering a refinance of your home, uh, and certainly focusing on that savings aspect. So building up 401k or other assets to help. And then uh, when you retire, possibly considering some part-time work to help bridge the gap if there is one there. Yeah, and I, again, Dennis, I was reading, uh, checking to see if there's any other questions. So I missed maybe the, the beginning part of your answer. So if I'm re repeating something, I apologize. Uh, mm -hmm. The most important thing anybody can do as they are approaching retirement, especially if they're underfunded for retirement, is really big focus on cutting your spending. Yep. So if you can kind of learn to live with a lot less, it will make it a lot easier during your retirement. And we had another question. What is the best way to store and organize these documents? So I mentioned a couple of ways when it comes to paper, definitely doing file folders, uh, dividers by year, category, et cetera. Uh, when you're sto storing these on your computer, on the cloud, in a drive, uh, I, I prefer personally to store it by year. And then within that year, you're gonna make the categories very similar to the way you would do a file filing cabinet. Um, it's just a lot easier to find those documents on your computer. Uh, for any any documents, should they be in a fireproof safe? Uh, so things like the uh, marriage certificates, divorce certificates, um, even your passport, you can keep those in a fireproof safe. For things like statements, um, and if you already have things on file digitally, not a big need. Um, I know if you do want to keep it in a fireproof sh safe, you're going to need a pretty big fireproof safe if you have a lot of documents. Um, so really the essentials in there. Uh, so filing cabinet with dividers, touched on that. Uh, how long should you keep paper documents? So we touched on tax documents, seven years. Uh, in general, that's going to be the max. You should keep any paper document, again, with things like receipts, utility bills. You can go ahead and trash those right away. And I'll say, just, just to confirm, uh, to, with the exception of things that pertain to basis on your home. Yes. You, know, you really, you know, you could own a home for 30, 40 years you know, theoretically, you've got to actually have documentation yep. when you sell that house. Yep, yep, for sure. Yeah, holding on to the titles and, and things of that nature. Also, the, the car titles, that's another thing that you may want to keep in paper. I know when you sell your car, if you sell it to someone else, uh, you have to that's sign the title. Point. So that's another thing to keep on paper. Uh, and then if you don't have a shredder, what's the best way? So we also touched a little bit on that. Uh, community shredding days and uh, taking it to your local UPS shop. Um, and then, yep, uh, I think that was a good point. Changing your preferences, if you're, in, if you're transitioning to changing your preferences to go digital through email, uh, when you do that, they'll generally already have all those documents that you're looking to shred. So most of the time you won't have to scan them in and that'll make life a little bit easier. And then the last question looks like we have here. Oh, we got another one. Uh, so if you have a TOD or POD account, does the recipient need to pay a state tax on receiving that account? Um, so a quick short answer is no, unless the person, well, the beneficiary won't have to pay a state tax. Um, at any point, you'll actually get a reestablished cost basis to the value of the account when the person that you inherited the account passed. So for example, uh, if someone passed and their account was worth $100,000, your basis is now $100,000. You don't have to worry about what their basis was. So uh, no tax needs to be paid on that. And same for bank accounts. Uh, generally, there's gonna be no tax consequences, especially because um, it's all basis when it comes to those accounts. 
Um, and then any recommendations of a receipts scanner? Um, so when it comes to that, generally a regular scanner, it can be a little bit cumbersome. There's actually, there are actually a few apps out there. Uh, I know I use one, it's called Genius Scan. And what it does is you hold your, your uh, phone's camera over it and it'll scan it and you can email it to wherever you'd like or store it on your phone and then download it onto your computer. So Genius Scan is, is a good scanning app for things like, like that. All right. So we get on all the questions? I believe so. So thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna be following up with a recording of the webinar and you can also find other recordings through our link here, afsfinancialgroup.com slash workshops. We have uh, many other items we've discussed through our webinars. Um, for those of you that are receiving the recording, I mentioned that there will also be a checklist on items to hold on to, along with how long you should hold on to them. So uh, Natalie in our office did a great job of uh, putting that together, putting that together uh, for you to have, and it starts to help you understand how long you should keep things and maybe even sparks interest in, uh, in creating a what if checklist to give mm -hmm. to someone who needs to know uh, where your things are. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we enjoyed giving this presentation and as always feel free to follow up at any point with any additional questions. Yeah, so thank thank you, you and stay safe. All right. Take Bye care. guys.